Hello guys, Tania Lopez here from Art e. Son. If you are new to my channel, welcome. Normally here, I talk about my art journey, a couple of studio vlogs, and of course, as much as I can, give you guys some business tips for running or starting your art business. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I did have a video about how to plan out your year as a visual artist. Um, such as myself, but I did mention that I was going to invite a fellow artist to come and chat with me, but she's more of a crafter. So she's a wood burner, Jeanette is her name, and she has been in the business for about eight years now. I wanted to go ahead and introduce her to you guys because she is one of the people that I have met here in North Carolina that has always been very helpful when it comes to you know, dipping your toes in different things as far as the crafting world goes. Now, we did have a nice little chat, not only about how she runs her business, but really the different income sources that you can have as a crafter. And I wanted to go ahead and get you guys on into the conversation. I hope you guys enjoy and learn something from it because I know every single time I sit down with Jeanette, there is always something that I get out of it because just like anything else, her business is always evolving always growing and she's always into something new and i find her to be a very valuable artist and crafter and friend and i want to go ahead and introduce her to you guys so let's just go ahead and get started hey. <laughs> all right guys so let's go ahead and get started we are here with jeanette like i told you and let's just get to it of the topic hey. of the day yeah so topic of the day is business planning for crafting businesses mm -hmm. right? so you and i have both been crafters for a very long time <laughs> artists um part of the business planning that i wanted to cover was kind of where do you see yourself and where do you want to go okay right um so in order to do that Obviously, and I saw you had a vision board. That was I pretty did. cool. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And I kind of have the same thing, but it's, I guess, in my head. Mm -hmm. And part of, you know, my monthly calendar and getting things going. But business planning for crafters would depend on how, where do you want to be? So if you're thinking of mostly doing craft shows, if you've never done craft shows before, then it would be start doing your research, start checking out shows in your area, how far do you want to travel, right. how much money do they cost, um, set up costs, do you have all the equipment that you need to actually set up at craft shows, mm -hmm. and then going into are you going to be doing online sales, is Etsy going to be your thing, right. is, um, are you going to be Shopify or some kind of website or whatever, and then there's um, the using social media. Mm -hmm. So to generate sales, if, are, if you're doing more craft shows in person versus trying to promote your stuff through the internet versus right. um, Etsy, I find that you can't really do both at the same time. Okay. Time-wise, okay? Because in order to actually generate that kind of promotion, so everybody says, oh, go on Etsy. And some people are fabulously successful at mm -hmm. Etsy, but most people don't realize how much time it takes them to actually be that successful at Etsy. Mm -hmm. You know, Etsy is kind of like you have to manipulate it every day. You have to be on there, do a whole lot of cross promotion. So it just depends on time. And I think I've told Tanya, time is your most precious commodity. Yeah, I feel the same um, way. <laughs> so you want to be able to concentrate on where you want to spend the most time versus where you think it would generate you the most income. Okay. Right? So maybe doing craft shows isn't your thing. If you've done a couple of craft shows and, man, this didn't work out, it wasn't worth it, whatever. Sometimes it's just hit or miss mm -hmm. because maybe it was just a bad day. Maybe it was raining. Maybe we've been there. We have been there. <laughs> um but I know some people who do just craft shows, they do sell on Etsy, but they use the craft shows as their networking tool. Right. So the networking is also a big thing where you're building your audience and finding your tribe through your craft shows mm -hmm. if you're gonna concentrate on local. Right. And it's a great way too to kind of gauge like 
what actually sells in yes. person mm -hmm. because you get that feedback immediately from the people that are looking at your stuff oh, and you definitely. see in person oh, what they like and what they're attracted exactly. to. I found that to be probably the best way for me. Mm -hmm. I used it more as kind of building my persona as an artist mm -hmm. and really trying to figure out what works for me. Yeah. And because of the craft shows, I mean, I've been doing this for eight years. Mm -hmm. So obviously I've done hundreds and mm -hmm. <laughs> hundreds of craft shows to the point now where I know where I can go and be successful and I know where I can. Okay. And it also helped me solidify my tribe, so to speak, mm -hmm. where I know I'm catering to a certain audience. I know where they are and not, here's my biggest, um, some some crafters, especially if you're new, you're not sure on pricing. My thing would be do some research, find out what other are the others are charging, but also don't know your worth, mm -hmm. so that you can charge what you need to charge in order to generate the income that you want to generate. Right. And so, how do we do that? We do that by planning, and whether your planning is seasonal. Mm -hmm. So I know some crafters, they'll create a whole bunch of stuff, say for Valentine's Day, for Christmas, for, you know, maybe they have a craft that caters to Halloween mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. And they'll concentrate on those. And those take months of planning. Right. Right. So, but if you're doing something that's more generic, that can be sold year round and it's not necessarily seasonally based, then I would highly suggest doing quarterly planning. So quarterly planning is taking those three months, mm -hmm. say like two quarters ahead. So for the first quarter of this year, I started planning in August mm -hmm. of last year. And again, that just becomes your time management and how you're, where you're spending your time to plan. Because I know I have so many workshops, I have so many shows, I have so many speaking engagements, whatever the case may be. So I'm now getting the stuff ready for my workshops in May. And right. it's February. One month <laughs> Yeah, or at least I started actually getting them ready like in January. So because you, the thing is that you don't want to get caught right before the event or right before, you know, you know, you have mm -hmm. a week before your next craft show. Well, you have no inventory. Guess what? You're never going to be able to generate enough crafts mm -hmm. to be able to sell. Right. So, you always got to yeah. make more. You, uh, you always <laughs> have to make more than what you think you're going to need. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's more like, um, you know, find out where you want to be. Um, sometimes it's trial and error, especially mm -hmm. with the craft shows, especially with that kind of stuff. I, I found... Uh, I call, two tribes is what I call them of organizers, event organizers that I absolutely love. I love working with them. They're extremely professional. They give you all of the details up front. They're very communicative. Mm -hmm. You never have a problem contacting them. Everybody who is professional vendor, part of their tribe, knows the rules. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now you have a very efficient way to know, especially in a supportive yeah. profession. And you know everybody's in that same hustle as you. Mm -hmm. um, also being able to, you know, Tanya is a very good person to tell me, hey, Jeanette, I think you should be doing. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> and, and I appreciate that and I accept all of those kind of with an openness and in my own head going, okay, how can I incorporate that? Where would I be going? Mm -hmm. And how does that fit into my timeline of what it is that I'm trying to accomplish? Right. You know what I mean? Because sometimes the answer is going to be no and sometimes the answer is going to be yes. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with different small groups of people in order to try to help them in certain ways. I don't, it's not unsolicited advice it's more like hey i've been working on this social network mm -hmm. thing how do you how do you go about it right you know that kind of thing just kind of giving back and forth some information i often find it very uh beneficial for me anyways when we do bounce off ideas because especially like when you do your research sometimes you may find something that mm -hmm. works for mm -hmm. me as well mm -hmm. uh, and i can kind of implement it in my yeah, own business definitely. even though what we do is very They're different, different yeah, yeah. Because I saw the sugar cane thing. I love that. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to do a little more education on that aspect yeah. there. And that's and that's all part of your planning. So mm -hmm. where 
where is your business going? Like right. really, what would be your ultimate goals? And if you've never stopped to consider it, I would I would definitely take some time to do some professional development, mm -hmm. whether that be doing some research or watching some YouTube videos on um, from small other small businesses who right. not I. No one's got it all figured out. I, I'm highly, <laughs> I highly believe that no one's got it all figured out. And what works for you isn't necessarily going to work for me. But and again, it's okay if yes. what, what you were doing didn't work for you even last year. The same mm -hmm. way we evolved on a personal level, our artistry and our craft evolves yeah. too. Yeah, you know. And sometimes you do have to do kind of like okay, let me let's say let me let me do the vendor shows just so that I can see if it is for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe you may find that maybe you lost a little bit of money in doing that. Maybe, who yeah. knows? Maybe you actually went ahead and did really good, but at least you found out, well, this is not for me. Yeah. Or sometimes you may actually get a lot from it, not necessarily what you thought you were gonna get. Yeah. It might not be the money that you get out of there, it might be all the connections that exactly. you get out of there. And exposure. Exactly. So it is, yeah, I can see that for And just sure. how much money are you willing to spend on just getting that exposure? Because, right. um, so like I said, so with the first year that I started out, all I wanted to do was craft shows. And so I did a bunch of research and I got it. And so I spent three years, I think I did like 80 to 100 craft shows. I was all over the place. And I, I remember. And I lost You had a database for I shows. I did. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> but at this point, it's just to help other people. And it's, and so here's what I realized. I realized that my particular craft just really isn't that conducive to a normal craft show. Say like, you know, at, at, at some kind of like brewery or mm -hmm. um, they're not looking for what I'm making, okay? right? And it's not it's not a good or bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that that's not my tribe. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's more of, um, is it cultural? Is it um, trending? You know, a lot of people try right. to generate stuff based on trends. And here's what I'm going to tell you: that if if you're only doing what's trending, those trends come and go. Mm -hmm. You know, so you want to be able to be genuine with what it is that you're making. Make something because you love making it. And then I find that your tribe will gravitate to you as opposed to you trying to force them into your world. Right. So that's, and that just takes time. And I think that's what frustrates a lot of crafters. Well, they'll start off gung ho and I'm going to make these clothes or I'm going to do this and then all of a sudden they, they spend six months just hard at it and then there's no sale. So there's nothing. And you have to have a really good level of perseverance mm -hmm. in order for this to succeed. So, well, and I found out that even when, when it comes to the vendor shows, mm -hmm. those are, it's almost like having little communities inside of bigger communities. Yes. So you have the vendor shows, but then even within that, for example, we, we met at the Puerto Rican festivals, mm -hmm. right? That's more of a cultural thing. Not every craft is going to do well yeah. in that kind of show, but yet you can go and maybe go to a holiday type of vendors mm -hmm. and do completely different. Yeah. Or if you have, uh, like, what's the name of this one over here in Raleigh, where it's art more closure. art closure. Those mm -hmm. are more, you know, canvases and frames, and that kind of art is completely different than... If you what go, is, yeah. yeah, or your powwows, yeah. you know, your powwows are something different. So mm -hmm. it's communities inside of bigger communities. And mm -hmm. you kind of can't give up on just, okay, well, these kind of shows didn't work for me. That means it's all vendor yeah. shows. It's not always like no, that. No, it's definitely not. And like I said, so I have like, I have a soap maker. She is fabulous at shows because she found her tribe. She's been doing these same shows for like the last eight mm -hmm. years to the point where she's built herself an audience and she just started doing loyalty cards for people who come and buy her soaps because they come to that show for her just to see her mm -hmm. do you see what i'm saying so when you go into a craft show especially again plan ahead so that you have everything ready so that you're not stressed out you're not trying to find where you're going to put your money you're not trying to find your packaging you're not trying you know all the things that go into a craft show speak to experienced craft show people mm -hmm. you know build your network don't think that you're going in this alone. Um, the people who I find have the hardest time with craft shows are the ones who are so independent 
that they don't, I mean, I'm, how are we? We are very independent yeah. people, okay? Yeah. But I'm still willing to um, have mentors, mm -hmm. you know? Even if they're not, if they're doing something that I can appreciate that they're doing very well, I'm going to go ask, how do you, how do you do that? How do you get that done? Right. Some people who will, most people, I would say most people, especially crafters and other artists are more than willing to share the information. Yeah. You know, they're not, well, I'm not telling you. Because they you know, know what it's like to exactly. be the one having to search mm -hmm. for that information. Yes. And find, find finding it difficult. Okay, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone, a crafter, does want to focus on vendor shows, right? You talked about breaking your year up um, between seasonal or quarterly. If mm -hmm. all I want to do is vendor shows, then how would I break up my year? Would I break it seasonal, mm -hmm. quarterly, by vendor shows? How would I do that? So I would... Start researching. So here's, it depends on what one your area. Mm -hmm. So if you start researching and you re, and you, like I live in a very remote area. I know anywhere that I'm going to travel for a show is going to be at least an hour away. Mm -hmm. Now will that show be worth my time? So on Facebook, I mean, goods and bads on Facebook. I'm not dealing with that. But on Facebook, a lot of the vendors and the organizers will post their events. Mm -hmm. There's a way that you can research that you can go in and see the reviews, see the comments that right. other vendors have put over the years. Um, right. And yeah, look at the type of vendors. That exactly. Are mm -hmm. Because if you are a handmade vendor, research shows, not research shows, but research the shows mm -hmm. that cater to handmade only. Right. Okay. Because there are a lot of event organizers that say that they're handmade, and then you go and you research the show, and it'll be paparazzi and Tupperware, and, mm -hmm. you know. And so, if that's not where you want to be um, clustered, mm -hmm. then just find other venues. Right. You know what I mean? Um, if that is your thing, you know, then that's you kind of know where you're going to be, you know. Right. Um, also, research the time of year so seasonal shows are hard okay because say if you're doing a fourth of july festival okay mm -hmm. you have to plan ahead for to be outside in the mega heat yes um so i know some soap makers and candle makers that won't do any shows at all during the summer because of their supplies because their products are yeah. gonna melt or they're gonna you know be destroyed by being out mm -hmm. there so that's what I mean by seasonal, as far as actual seasons, not holidays, but mm -hmm. those seasons. Okay. So if you're a crafter, crocheter, and all you make is knit hats and scarves, are you really going to go to a show in the middle of the summer? Correct. No. Mm -hmm. You got to go to Stay away. away. <laughs> mm -hmm. No one is thinking about buying scarves and, and hats. Right. So then you, as a crocheter, then you either have to make the winner's your season yeah or find a different product exactly. that works during exactly right gotcha. yeah so um if you are a um like the soap is soap is non-seasonal as far as because it's a consumable product so if you make consumable products then you have to consider okay like summertime thing mm -hmm. but if if you can manage somehow to switch over into online sales Mm -hmm. like Etsy or Facebook Marketplace or Shopify or something, where those people who are now addicted to your product can continue buying your product even if they can't make it to the craft show. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's where it starts to, the planning really starts to come into effect because you're going, okay, I don't want to disappoint my tribe. I've worked so hard. I've built up my audience. How can I get them the product without sacrificing my sales? You right. know, by mm -hmm. not being at a show, so to speak. Um, well, we did learn a lot, too, with the pandemic as far as how devastating it is for artists and crafters Ooh, yeah. when we don't have those vendor shows to kind of mm -hmm. fall back on, mm -hmm. you know. And I think kind of that's kind of also why I ventured off a little bit more to the online world. Mm -hmm. Now, you did mention the social media, right? Uh, yeah. And you seem to use social media more to keep in connection with your customers and other crafters mm -hmm. rather than for sales yes. am i right right okay um mm -hmm. and the reason being so what i do is i, I do handcrafted wood burning stuff okay 
what I've watched, you also have to watch the trends. What's going on in your particular crafting world, okay? So what I noticed is several things happened towards the end of 2019 into the, and it wasn't even COVID related. It wasn't, it wasn't even really because of that. I had already started um, putting my workshops into place. Mm -hmm. You know, that took like six months of planning before I even launched my first workshop. I remember, I yeah. remember that time, yes. So what I noticed was the trends in more people buying laser printers, mm -hmm. Glowforge, Crycut, Mm -hmm. All of those technologically based things that were kind of trying to encroach and replace the handmade wood burning people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's not that even there's a there's a lot of us. There's not a lot of us in the community. There are thousands, but locally to me there aren't any. Mm -hmm. Like people really have to search me out if they want something that's hand drawn wood burned, but they can easily find somebody now who's doing laser engraving, okay? So I had to start thinking and planning ahead of how can I replace my what I'm doing currently with something that would be more beneficial to me and more specialized where I can't be replaced by a laser printer. Okay. Do you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So that's how this whole sustainable, renewable thing and me working with gourds and bamboo and all that is because they can't stick a gourd in a laser <laughs> right do you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that it, it it all part it's all part of the planning on where do you see yourself in a year where do you see yourself in three years where do you want to be in five years and that planning starts now and it can be just a little micro seed you know, I say the size of a mustard seed. So start off small with just throwing down some ideas, whether that be a vision board, whatever. So, and then start working, being very deliberate in your decisions on how you're going to achieve those goals. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if you are wanting to, you know, have a master online, online business, you don't ever want to do a craft show. And some people just don't. They're not social. They, you know, you and I are like out there. Yeah. We're, we're laughing. We're joking. Well, we're we have people that are moms and yeah. families. They have other mm -hmm. obligations. They don't necessarily want to make this one a full time. This isn't a full time job. Right. Whereas, you know, this is my full time job. Mm -hmm. This is your full time job. Well, not really full time job, but I got you. eventually mm -hmm. it can be. So, um, I just want to make a little bit of extra money. Okay, well, making a little bit of extra money in a handmade business is kind of like a fallacy because you have to put so much time mm -hmm. into doing it. Um, otherwise, it's just otherwise, a hobby and yeah. just sit in your house. Exactly. So, but again, even realizing that if you're going to be going only online sales, even if you start an e-commerce website, which again, takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money to set up a website with e-commerce mm -hmm. and everything, finding out all those little details that will frustrate you, make you bang your head against the table, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, to do getting um, exposure through like Pinterest, mm -hmm. or are you a video person? You know, do those things come easily to you? How can you generate people to drive traffic through your website so they actually even see your product? Right. And then trying to find the audience that is going to convert those views into sales. So that again takes a lot of planning. You don't and just throw mm -hmm. the spaghetti against the wall to see if it sticks with those things. You you have to have a very set plan and goals. So if you know you say I can say okay by the end of next week I'm going to have my Pinterest page set up. I'm going to start pinning, and then again you realize quickly Pinterest is a daily activity. It is, but it has to. But I'm saying, if you want to drive that kind of traffic, you have to dedicate the time. So, right. I've gone there, gone that road, mm -hmm. realized I did not have the time. Mm -hmm. Time being my biggest commodity, <laughs> to sit and play with Pinterest for three hours a day. Right. So, mm -hmm. kind of like this is the thing. It's almost like you have to sort of make a choice yes, right if you're going to be choice. in person in vendor shows now you can either decide to do that for a short period of time 
so that you can pull mm -hmm. that that audience into your website into your social media mm -hmm. or you can choose to go the online route which then in this instance i would say my personal opinion mm -hmm. that social media is very vital if you totally. are mainly doing this online mm -hmm. right so with her if all she's doing is in-person stuff right vendor shows and workshops and things like that then really she utilizes the social media more just to kind of keep up with people okay yeah. it's almost like a hey don't forget about me i'm right here yeah. by the way i'll be over here yes next weekend and mm -hmm. that's the way she's using it she's mm -hmm. not necessarily using social media to sell mm -hmm. but as a crafter if you do want to go ahead and just not do the vendor shows then pinterest or um, Instagram or Facebook groups, then those are the, the things that you want to go ahead and focus on. But they are time consuming. Now, mm -hmm. yes, in a way, it is a daily thing. But what I'm going to input here is it's not a daily thing in the I'm going to sit down every day and post on Pinterest. Oh, yeah. Because no. I'm going to sit down one day and I'm going to schedule for the whole week. Exactly. According to the social media. <laughs> yeah. According to them, I'm there every single day. And you but I'm not. Do, yeah. And you can do the same thing with Facebook and Instagram. And now. Instagram. You can sit. But again, it, just plan the time mm -hmm. to say, okay, on Friday, I am going to schedule all of my activities mm -hmm. for the entire week so that it looks like you're there in person every right, day that right. you're not. Okay. You mentioned something like that too when it comes to your pictures and your images. You may be working on a project today. You're taking pictures of it today. Oh, yeah. But your social media or your online presence may not see it till weeks, later on. Weeks ahead. And so, and, and that I realized too because um, people who concentrate on the social media aspect of it they they put themselves in a I, I will say they it's too much pressure. Mm -hmm. It's too I much pressure that. to come up with content and images for every day of the week. Mm -hmm. And some people are just obsessed with it. And and so I post once a day. I'll go back maybe two or three times throughout the day to uh, respond to comments. I'm I'm not checking for my likes. I'm not checking for, you know, how many people love me that day. It, right. It's not <laughs> when you, when you, and when it's more about a popularity contest, that's when it starts to lose. It's appeal for you. It's appeal for me. <laughs> yes. When, and I've never, and I've, that's probably why, like some people say, oh, you have so many followers on Instagram. Well, yes, but I didn't, if you understand that I, I initially my goal was to have that kind of presence, mm -hmm. okay, on Instagram especially. Not necessarily Facebook. For some reason, at the time, Facebook was not, and even now I notice that it's going down even more, whereas I can post something on Instagram and have like 100 and something likes or and like 30 comments if mm -hmm. it's something that's interesting versus like seven on Facebook. On Facebook. Yeah. Okay. So it's where do you want to spend your time? And so in order to build that Instagram audience, it took a full solid year of me spending two to three hours a day mm -hmm. doing nothing but Instagram. Right. Okay. And I would hide I'm not gonna explain how I did it. You can go <laughs> YouTube um, yeah, you know, all that. that there's, there's, there's a lot of research that goes in, and it's nothing that's manipulative. It's nothing. It has to be genuine, and so that's that's how I notice like the artists who do have like 10k or whatever. Mm -hmm. They do the videos. They do instructions. They do a lot of things that gains people. They'll do giveaways, and again, there's always a way to build that audience. But what are you getting out of it? Okay. Right. So for me, it was really just exposure. Not necessarily the sales because I I found a better way for me to generate my income and it was through my workshops. And again, mm -hmm. this was just over time, throwing the spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks until I realized I needed to actually plan, sit and plan, um, how I was going to generate that income. So the workshops have worked for me. Digital can mm -hmm. definitely be an avenue for me. Um, and not necessarily doing it by holiday or season, but just where do I want to be by this set time? So you right. can set a goal, but it has to have a date. You, you don't just say, oh, by next year, I'm going to be doing this. No, you say by August 12th, mm -hmm. I will have 
my website set up, even if it's a free website, even if it's just something like a portfolio, yeah, mm -hmm. a gallery so that people can come and see mm -hmm. where you are, what you're doing. You can put a little calendar up there saying these are where my shows are going to be, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, but set the date and then move on to the next one. Because until you hit those goals, the next one are going to be easier to reach. Right. You see what I'm saying? You always have to stay a step ahead. Yes. So even like when it comes to the vendor shows you mentioned, you were planning for it or prior to. And I yeah. remember you always telling me um, when I first started out selling the crafts was, oh, if you're going to be there for the holidays, you want to make sure you're starting in whatever, yes. July, whatever it may be, because you want to be a step ahead. So and this, mm -hmm. this applies whether you're doing things online or in person, you have to think ahead of what's coming. Yes. <laughs> so I'll give you a really good example of that. So I'm in four different shops, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I take my product wholesale, whatever, on uh, consignment. I take them to the shops every month. So the shops that are very successful are the ones that change over. With the season. For the season, mm -hmm. for the holidays mm -hmm. especially. So I have one shop. They do a fat, well, I have several shops, but this one shop is fabulous. They've been in business for like 10 years, or I think it's at least almost 10 years, and they promote every artist that's in there. They change over seasonally, and they ask me, Jeanette, by, say, like for Valentine's Day, you need to start bringing your stuff by the beginning of January because they're already merchandising and mm -hmm. getting ready for that specific holiday. So... How am I at planning for holidays? Terrible. Zero. Mm -hmm. None. I'm horrible at it. I'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to get better. <laughs> so so say right now, I'm working on Easter eggs. Right. Why? Because I need to get them to my shops because by that time. By, by the time Valentine's Day is over in just a few days, they're already changing over for Easter. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I need to get if I want my merchandise to sell. I need to be on their schedule. So here's part of the business planning for handcrafted people. Don't just go by your own schedule. See what's going on around you. In your community. In your community, especially if you plan on selling at shops and doing consignment or some kind of wholesale, that if you get there a week before Christmas to sell your Christmas stuff, your stuff's not going to sell. Now, you're done. As far as consignment, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about more seeing what's in your local community and what do you suggest for crafters to of how to make those kind of connections so you can contact the shop owners directly sometimes it'll be a referral like somebody who's in the shop already they may say you can ask them how do you do in that shop because not all shops are created equal mm -hmm. okay here's um and i've had some people reach out to me and say oh well do you think a 50 percent consignment fee is high uh, yeah, but here's what you need to take into account. Anywhere between 30% and 50% is the norm, okay? A 50% consignment just means that you price your items 50% higher mm -hmm. just to make sure that you generate the income that you're wanting to generate out of it, okay? And, okay, so then let's, let's take it back just a little bit. Mm-hmm. How can crafters who are just getting in or whatever it may be, how can they spot these kind of consignment stores? Because I know I've noticed it's like the ones that would say either a boutique or a local yeah. uh, art and frames kind of thing. Those are different kind of shops. Yeah, so it's different. We're in the South, so a lot of them will be like Southern, whatever. <laughs> but you need to, so here's my, my biggest thing is you just need to get the footwork in. You mm -hmm. have to go and visit. And the same thing with the craft shows. Go and visit them before you actually apply to them. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously this is going to be like a year out, but go and visit them. Talk to the shop owner. See how they treat you as a customer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notice how they're merchandising. Do they take care? Are they rotating their merchandise? Will they make sure that you're seen? Um, because there are some shops that I've been in and my stuff has just sat there for years. Right. With the, without anything. Well, you have to make sure yeah. that that shop fits your yes. crafts too. Because I know here I'll see stuff that are different. Like I've seen so some consignment shops that maybe 
they are more prone to go for like the jewelry makers yeah. or other ones are more beachy so they go for yeah. you know the soaps and all that stuff and those are the ones that they cater to and always make sure at least what i see is that they are given that local artists grow They'll, they yes. should have some kind of business cards or follow so and so it should yeah. be in that area or if they're on social media just check because everybody this is a whole marketing is not marketing okay mm -hmm. and part of if part of your business planning is hope marketing then i would tell you you need to stop and do some more professional development hope marketing is i'm gonna post this i just spent blah 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 hours and so so much money making this i want to sell it uh i'm gonna send this post to my best friend i'm gonna tag her in it and i want her to share it 50 million times Okay. That's not going to generate sales. Right. It's that's not. Expecting people to share your post just because they like you is not going to happen. Same like people that expect their family members to buy yes. this stuff. <laughs> um and in all honesty, the most of the time when I get something from like not even close friends, but and it's kind of like far off relatives. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want that, but they expect it for free. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you're not part of my circle. You have no idea what I do, how much time I'm making it. Okay, but as far as shops, it's it's easy. And plus, if you build those relationships with those shop owners, mm -hmm. they're more willing to call you when you're out of stock or getting low on inventory, saying, hey, um, we just sold blah, blah, blah. Can you come and restock or whatever? But it's more in their best interest if you're more aware of what their needs are. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I know that my shop up there, they know I'm kind of busy. Mm -hmm. So they don't call me, but they appreciate when I'm cognizant of their needs. Yes. So if they're doing all kinds of posting now on social media for Valentine's Day, okay, Valentine's Day is two days away now, but they've been posting on it for several weeks now. Mm -hmm. So now I know that as soon as Valentine's Day is over, they're changing over their displays for Easter. Now it's my responsibility if I actually want to make sales to get my stuff there in time for them to actually display and incorporate it. So, so basically being safe. accountable for your own yes. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you don't you can't rely necessarily on somebody else to sell your stuff. You still have to be there in person. Mm -hmm. You still have to maintain a good inventory mix. So even if you're not creating stuff necessarily seasonal. How can you incorporate your stuff so that it's seen at all? Whether that be through social media, maintaining, rotating your inventory on Etsy. Because people, okay, I have an Etsy page. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have one thing on there. I got an email the other day that says, visits to your shop one. And I'm like, why did it even bother? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Because I don't have time. That's not my focus. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Etsy was never part of my long-term planning. I keep Etsy because I have, ironically enough, people who reach out to me and won't purchase anything from me unless I list it on Etsy. Okay. I, I don't know why. I, I, I'm i sure there's a reason. I'm for sure it. they have a reason, too. And I don't ask. I just do and so in that aspect i keep one thing that renews every six months or whatever for 60 cents on it <laughs> i mean whatever the case may be um just to kind of make them happy mm -hmm. do you see what i'm saying so if i was focusing on etsy if i didn't want to do craft shows and i was focusing on etsy i would obviously put more time into it but back to the craft shows real quick because i was talking about the time aspect of craft shows so you're not going to be able to get into a, say, a Mother's Day show, right? Mother's Day shows, the event organizers are, have already thrown out those applications online. Okay, so if you see shows, if you type in Mother's Day craft shows, you're going to see a whole slew of events. And now it's your responsibility to get to those websites, to those event organizers, see when the application opens. And, and when it, and the deadlines mm -hmm. and the deadlines to pay, mm -hmm. right? So I'll give you a great example of that is Southern Charm at the Farm. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's I a huge, not. huge show. Okay, there's like three hundred something vendors. They 
build up the anticipation for when the application is going to open. And I think they give you two days, two days yeah. to apply. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I'm talking about this is time. There are vendors that will sit and wait at the computer at 12 midnight for that application to open. Send it in. Why? Because thousands of people just mm -hmm. applied to get into that show. And some vendor shows are actually curated as well. So you may not even get in, even if you apply to that deadline. Exactly. You got to fit their, their theme yes. or whatever it may be. Exactly. And you have to be able to go by, abide by their rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, planning ahead because if they say white tent only mm -hmm. and you submit the application and then you show up at the event with a blue tent you're not gonna set up they're not gonna <laughs> let you set up you are not setting up and i did see that it when i first you started follow the yeah. rules. <laughs> that's why okay so when i first started doing vendor shows i i'm a research kind of person so i did a lot of research before i even bought anything and i did see that there were shows that didn't care about it but the way i see it is if i know that at some point, maybe not today, but if I know at some point I may want to go ahead and get into that vendor show and they require a 10 by 10 white tent, I'm just going to go ahead and buy the 10 by 10 white tent mm -hmm. so that I can have that meet whatever guideline or exactly. regulations it may be. Mm -hmm. And I know some people, they kind of just throw in it like last minute and they want to go ahead and get, like you said, a blue tent out of nowhere and it might get you by but it's going to limit the the numbers of vendor shows that you can so do. that to to give an example so that would be the difference between getting into like a farmer's market mm -hmm. right or a flea market mm -hmm. versus a high end like art pleasure like, yeah <laughs> they are not as flexible on your budget, mm -hmm. so to speak. So if you bought that blue pen, blue tent because at the mm -hmm. time that was all you could afford, then by all means, do everything in your power that you can possibly do using that blue tent until you build up enough income right. to go ahead and upgrade yourself. You should be constantly looking to invest in your business. So here's, again, part of the planning. How can you generate enough income that you can, one, pay your bills, and two, have enough money to generate to put back into your business to help you grow. Mm -hmm. Because I find too that the people who do it, like again, full-time artist, full-time this is my life versus just the hobbyist, they're just, the hobbyist just wants to make some money. They just want to go into their garage, do whatever it is that they're doing, go to a farmer's market, sell it, and whatever they made is just bonus cash, mm -hmm. whatever. Well, the full-time artist is... The, their goal is more business oriented and so business planning so that's marketing advertising um upgrade of materials upgrade mm -hmm. of you know what i mean so it's the difference between going to the dollar store and buying a set of coloring pencils right. versus going to like hobby lobby and spending you know a hundred dollars on the maximum yeah. beautiful set All of art Christmas supplies you see like what i'm that. saying mm -hmm. so it that's what I'm talking about. That's part of the planning. The planning is being able to invest back into your business. Where do you want to be? Also, if you're going to be doing craft shows, make sure that you have the money available to pay for the fees. For the fees. And not only the fees, but the food that you're going to spend, the travel money. Mm -hmm. If you the have stay, to, if you have to yeah, stay. Yeah, hotel if you have to if you have to do that. Like I'm planning right now. I'm planning to go to Georgia. I mean, on my calendar right now, I have Georgia, I have Maryland, I have Virginia. Possibly Pennsylvania, um, Cherokee, North Carolina. I have to make sure that I have enough money to cover my hotels once I get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gas, food, you know, gas all that. and everything. So it's not just, and also making sure that when you get there, that you actually have enough inventory and that you found your tribe and that you've done the research in the area to make sure that you actually have enough sales, not only to break even. So that you've covered all your travel expenses, but to generate income, because mm -hmm. that's the goal, right? We just want to make money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one thing to do what you love, love what you do. How do I love what I do, do what I love, and still pay my bills so that I can, you know, drive my Survive car and have somewhere to live? <laughs> Survive all of it. Yeah. So, okay. Really quick. So, we talked about um, vendor shows. We talked about selling online mm -hmm. um 
We talked about finding places in your local community, such as consignment stores, mm -hmm. to sell. So those are three sources we were before that we started recording. We were talking about a fourth um, resource. Well, really more like four and five, okay? Because she kind of touched on it and it's workshops. So now we're not talking about making money off your crafts, but rather making money off your skills, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So right now, Jeanette does workshops in person. I did kind of touch bases on turning these kind of workshops in more of a, what do I always talk about? Passive <laughs> income. <laughs> Passive <laughs> income, right? That is my number one goal for 2022 is... Mm -hmm creating passive income so i did touch basis on that but it does bring two other sources of income mm -hmm. for crafters kind of getting out of that box like okay i make my product it is absolutely wonderful but if you're trying to make this a long-term thing what other sources of income yeah. there are and mm -hmm. so workshops is one of them yeah right and i didn't jump into that lightly i should say because in order to teach a successful workshop you have to have all the materials. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it, it was where I was investing my money. Mm -hmm. Like the money that I was generating through my business, how was I investing? I was investing it so that I could grow. And that meant, um, I think it was like my, my initial investment into being able to teach workshops was almost a thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. And that's buying all the tools, all the materials, all the, um, marketing materials. So, all you know, additional business cards, printing services, right. You know, there's a lot that goes into being able to teach those workshops and also the time to prep. Right. right? And make the connection so that and you have sites. Exactly. Location. So some people, like, they'll have, say, like, the Preppy Possum is a good example. That That is a local storefront, mm -hmm. and they she has a studio space, and it's the sip and paints. So everybody goes there. She supplies the canvas and the paints. They go. They spend an hour or two hours, whatever. And they drink their wine and they kind of hang out and mm -hmm. everybody comes out with this beautiful little canvas that they, it's not a little, you know, big size yeah. canvas. That, and it's an awesome concept because people love to gather. They love mm -hmm. to be able to talk and have fun and then they make something too. Uh, so the concept just grew from there. So now you can see if you, if you search, you'll find people who are teaching workshops on candle pouring, mm -hmm. on soap making on baskets the basket weaving mm -hmm. um quilt making like there's so many different workshops because even if they're not going to go off and do this professionally like you're not you know like you're doing they just want to have a taste of it they want right. to see what's really involved in it and that's part of the fun mm -hmm. so being able to have one storefront to do that was one thing well i did not have a storefront so i had to use my network <laughs> Networking, mm -hmm. yeah, making those connections, making those connections, and even some that were um, cold calls. You know, I just cold call. I send an email or a call. I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm a wood burning artist. This is what I do. I've researched your location. I have researched your area. I think this would be a good fit. Blah blah blah. And of course, I had a ton of people who said no. Yeah. Okay. Fear of failure. Should it's not be in your repertoire. But it's a thing. Yeah. It is It is a me mega thing, and I understand it. But at the same time, it to me, it motivates me. When people tell me no, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, you are now not part of my repertoire. <laughs> and I'm going to move on and find somebody who is. But you do also have to be sure of yourself and yeah. what you're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And you, when you are making these phone calls, you can't go in it doubting yourself. And don't get an attitude about it either. Like, right. do not ever burn bridges. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, even those people who told me, no, I don't think it's a good fit. They know something more about their area and their tribe that I don't know. Right. So there's a reason they said no. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit there and force them and try to convince them that I'm the best or I you need me there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not going to happen. I don't do that. It's more like, oh, cool. Okay, how can this happen? How can we make this happen? Where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what ended up happening is because I've been, I've been doing this, this is going into my third year now with workshops. With workshops on it. And because it's kind of gone far and wide, I've adapted so that I can do homeschoolers as well, um, seniors, 
there's there's niches within that mm -hmm. that can be explored and again that was part of my planning because of course when you first sit down i'm like i'm gonna teach workshops i'm gonna teach to all these different people well it took me two years before i was able to get it together enough to say okay now i'm open to homeschooling Gotcha. Or now I'm open to, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You have to get to a certain point before you um, explode in, in any separate direction. But here's what happened. Just from the exposure, like I said, I use social media as an exposure. Mm -hmm. I use it for my networking. I don't use it necessarily for sales. For sales. I can. At any given time, I can, I can definitely turn myself over and say, okay, now I'm selling from Facebook. Um, it generates its own sales through custom orders. People reach out to me and they say, oh, they like what I'm working on or they like a workshop or, or whatever. Yeah, they'll, like they'll reach out to me and I'm not relying on that. Do you, know, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? So by having that exposure and showing how much fun people are having at the workshops and what we're doing and that they're learning something new <clears throat> and all that, it, it, it started a trickle of people now reaching out to me, mm -hmm. can you come do a workshop with us? Right. So it's now no longer me trying to hustle, trying to find somewhere to teach a workshop. It's more like, can I even fit you in my schedule? That's a good thing. A it good is problem a problem to have. It is a good problem. But you, it didn't happen overnight. Like mm -hmm. I said, I'm going into my third year. And that's probably, like I said, the downfall on some of the crafters when they're starting on something like this is having the perseverance and being okay with the weight and with the word no and with the word no because <laughs> <And with the, laughs> no. people tell me no all the time you have no idea and sometimes i come off strong so it's, it's just the New Yorker. it's the enthusiasm <laughs> But being able to have that enthusiasm to show that you love what you do, mm -hmm. that's going to carry through no matter It'll what you're translate. doing. Whether yeah. you're doing a craft show, whether you're selling online, doing a little real video, or, or posting to social media. So here's what I will tell you as a handcrafter. If you are trying to sell your stuff, don't just put something like, made this today, isn't it great? No one's going to buy it. No one's going to buy it process you have to share the connection and here's what i mean by the connection so if i create something so i'll show you and i brought something to this to, <laughs> so i it's a i've been working on this idea for like i don't know if you can see it but it's a little flask it's a gourd flask obviously i said i was working on gourds but this is this tiny little thing. You know why I love this so much? Because it's tiny. I hand drew mm -hmm. the sunflowers. And my motto on social media is, hey, sunshine. Mm -hmm. And the sunflowers kind of represent the sunshine for me. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saying, you know why I love this? Look at that beautiful little sunflower. Isn't that pretty? Like, it just reminds me of blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Not so long. Not the big 15 paragraph story. But, you know, yeah. this is why this touches my heart. This is why I make it. And you'd be surprised at how many people would just, oh. Yeah, and some people yeah. care more about the why you made it, not yes. necessarily about the product. And I, I actually can think of one crafter right now. She, I'm not going to put her business out there, but the reason she crafts is to make money for something very personal for her. Yeah. And people... They related more to her story and to her as a crafter and to her as an artist. They related to the person yes. more than they did whatever she was crafting. I mean, what she crafts, there's a whole, I don't know how many other hundreds or thousands of people that craft, but for some reason, that one personable moment is what makes a difference from someone exactly. buying from you. And this is actually very important to. Um, when you're selling in vendor shows. Oh, God, yeah. Because a lot of the times they come in and they'll talk to you and they fall in love with you and that's the reason why. Yeah. Or maybe they saw your Hey Sunshine post, right? And they come looking for you. And they for come you. looking for you. I've yes. had people come looking for me, not because they didn't they didn't have much money to buy all the stuff, mm -hmm. but they just wanted to go and show yeah. support and meet this person you know, live and show them love and support in that way. I just recently, but I did a show in Wilmington, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wilmington is four hours from my home. But the people that I was talking to, they always had gourds. And they're like, oh, my dad does gourds, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, 
I'm, mm-hmm. doing, I'm gonna be teaching a workshop at the Gore Festival in Raleigh. Why don't you guys bring him by? Oh, that'd be a great idea. Guess what? They, they showed, showed up. up. They showed up with his dad and his mom Aww. to come look at the gourds. And they were like, thank you so much mm-hmm. for telling us about it. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, do you think that if I would have said, well, there's a gourd festival coming up. <laughs> feel free to show up if you feel, you know what I mean? The whole attitude would have been different. They would have been like, I ain't going to that show. Right. I'm just saying. I know. I, yeah, I've seen that. And and, so and be ready to describe why you do your art. So, obviously... But I, I find that a lot of artists find that really uncomfortable. Like I feel like people, <sighs> crafters and artists, really hate talking about themselves and talking about their work. For whatever reason it may be. Then find another way. So, even if it's putting a little descriptive plaque, print something up, put it on a piece of cardboard in front of whatever it is, mm-hmm. and say, I make these in honor of my grandma, blah, 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 who lived in blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, who blah, blah, blah. Tell the story somehow. And sometimes you don't even have to really tell the story. So, like, when we were at the Puerto Rican Festival in mm-hmm. Greensboro, I had done a plaque. It was Santa Barbara, right? Okay. I don't know if you remember that. So, And also, don't be discouraged if your stuff doesn't sell at craft shows. It just means it hasn't found its person yet. Yes. Okay? Because I can tote stuff from show to show to show, and then I'll have that one person that doesn't even speak to me Mm -hmm. and says, I'll buy it. Right. Yes. You know? It's also like gauging your crowd. But the lady stopped. She looked at it, and she stared at it literally for two minutes. And my husband and I standing there, we're just watching her. I didn't say anything to her. (laughs) I wouldn't even go up to her because I knew there was something moving inside of her by her looking at that that was more than me at that moment. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? It wasn't about me at that moment. And when she finally turned around, I could see the recognition in her face. And all I did was nod. And she ran into my arms and she started crying. Literally ran into my arms and started crying. Now, of course, I had a price in my head for what I wanted for that. But with that kind of reaction, I kind of asked her, I I just asked her, how much do you want? How much do you want it for? And she said, can I do it for this price? And I said, of course I can. Even if it wasn't the price that I was looking for. Because at that moment, it wasn't about me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about me trying to make the most money by taking advantage of what she was feeling by seeing that. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes it's, it is the emotional connection. Yeah. You know, where it's, it's not about, oh, I just need to make as much money as I possibly can at that craft show. Yes. That is always a goal. You always have that at the back of your mind, but guarantee there's people out there that are going through some stuff and And if you just happen to be that the person for that need yes and whether it and it sounds stupid but even if it's like the name of a soap the name of a soap can trigger Mm -hmm. or a scent or a scent Mm -hmm. yes or you know like you do a lot of the puerto rican so like the coffee pot Mm -hmm. you know where we'll remember i'll remember my grandmother Mm -hmm. making coffee in that pot and that's the reason i'm gonna buy that wallpaper or buy that digital print and have it on my phone or whatever Mm -hmm. the case may be do you see what i'm saying it's those connections that you can build up and and i get it some crafters they there is it's harder to get to those do you see what i'm saying like they don't necessarily have the story they just make it because they're doing trending like making baby clothes or headbands or stuff like yeah yeah they just make to but again even then even though you to you your story may seem insignificant it's not to them and they may even when it comes to that i think every crafter if you really start thinking about why you began to do that specific craft in the first place because okay i just mentioned headbands you know but maybe Mm -hmm. the reason you started creating baby headbands was because you're you know your baby or or you know your grandbaby or whatever. I've, I've met baby. um I've met uh, instances. Someone's daughter had leukemia. And, you know, she had lost her hair. Oh, she was looking yeah. for the big bows and the big headbands, and maybe that's what made her do it. You know, and so there's always a story. So I think if you kind of figure out the why, why you yourself are doing this, 
and you actually share that, you never really know who is going to relate mm -mm. to the story that you are right now. Yeah. Maybe the only reason you're doing this because you are a single mom just trying to make it. And someone can relate to that story. And they, they will be there for you in yeah. some kind of way. So you just never know. When it comes to social media, I do think that it is very important to share a little bit of yourself yeah. all the time. Like, I really need to go back and do, like, an introduction. Like, whenever I gain so many followers, I try to say, like, hey, I'm Just in Jen. case. <laughs> Just in case you haven't met me. <laughs> Just in case you haven't met me. Um, but to go back to the story real quick. So, usually at my workshops... Somebody somewhere somewhere along the line somebody will ask me how did you get into wood burning? Mm -hmm. Just wood burning in general and I tell them the story mm -hmm. You know whether or not they can relate to the story is something else, but it kind of gives them the why mm -hmm. It doesn't tell them how Like how did I get from just burning That's little Christmas ornaments to now teaching workshops because there is just so much more involved but they want to know. Mm -hmm. They want to know. And if you're doing it, if you're presenting it in a way that's relatable, that's not um, emotionally harsh, so to speak, um, because sometimes I feel like the bitterness can come out in a way. Um, Yours? or No, 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 not mine, but like just talking in general. Like I've met some, obviously I've done hundreds of craft shows. So like I'll go to, an, to a, a vendor booth and say the person isn't like really personable. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you kind of feel like a bitterness, like they're mad that they haven't made any money yet today, mm -hmm. or they're mad that, you know, there's guy two booths down from them that has the same exact thing and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. That's I've gone to shows where I've made zero dollars. Yeah. I mean, and I, but instead of like being bitter, so like any potential customer that does come by, now you're just upset and you're complaining to the person next to you, blah, blah, blah. Have it show face all the time. Yeah. Smile. Hey, yes. Thank you so much. Blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever the case. That actually kind of reminds me really quick, even though it, vendor shows <laughs> can basically be its own video. But <laughs> let me just put this here. Regardless of the vendor shows that you do, or even being in a consignment mm -hmm. store, never ever talk bad about the staff, the organizers, the promoters, none of that. You do not want to bash anyone that's in any organization because one, most of the times, regardless of the community that you're in, it's, it's a, a small, small community. community. <laughs> and you're not going to get invited to places. Yeah. You never know who knows who what. And uh -uh. I've kind of been in the backdrop too. Like I've been in behind the scenes when it comes to creating and organizing. And I kind of feel a little more for them. They are under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. So you just kind of want to go in there and try to make the best of yeah. any situation. Because we've been in places where... We don't get the sales. Maybe it's colder than it was projected to be. Or rain, like when we were in Charlotte. <laughs> it rained. But you kind of just go and have a good time. Yeah. If you go with that mindset, I'm sure you'll get something out of it. Mm -hmm. Even if it is just networking. Yeah. I mean, Jeanette and myself, we actually met through Instagram. Yeah. And that's... That was our initial and the connection. Show, and the first time we met a person was at a show. At a show. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you the value of that type of networking on Instagram. Okay. So, like, I post a lot of where I'm going to be, where I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to be. So, and I have people all over the U.S. and worldwide. So that when I say, okay, I'm traveling to, I had a show in Baltimore. One of my Instagram friends mm -hmm. said, hey, I'm 20 minutes from that location. Do you want to come stay with me? What? Perfect. Of course. Yes. I would love to. Mm -hmm. And so after the show, when I went back to our house, we sat and we had a couple of hours of just wood burning sessions. Got just it. hanging out. We had dinner. We had laughs. It was it was so much, so awesome. And it's like, that is what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Where it goes beyond just, you know, liking their posts or whatever. But once you get to know these people a little bit more, they can be a bigger network. Mm -hmm. And if I say... I'm traveling to New Mexico. Who's got my back? Yeah. Oh, Jeanette, I'm in Tennessee. Can we stop and meet for coffee? Of mm -hmm. course, I would love to. 
that just builds the community. It's a different kind of family. It is a different kind of family. <laughs> but again, that could takes planning and planning ahead. So you you can't, um, like I said, I'm planning. My schedule goes through right now through November, mm -hmm. right? As far as December, I normally take off just to do commissions and and whatever you know Christmas gifts mm -hmm. people order and stuff for me. But through November. So I'll put it on my website, I'll put it on my calendar, and I'll say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be here in October. Who's in the area? You know, right. or uh, anybody want to stop and meet for coffee, blah, 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 right? So now I'm not only advertising myself because I'm traveling to your area, but I'm advertising them who are local, mm -hmm. and I can hashtag them and say, have you not met this local candle maker who is mm -hmm. right here in your area and is at this shop, at this shop, at this shop? Mm -hmm. I'm totally blasting them out into the universe right. by being able to plan ahead. I would never call somebody and say, hey, I'm showing up in two days. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Why? You wanna, yeah, you want to make those connections. Because and... they have their own plans. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I can so, see that. Yeah, I you know I have people do that like, um, I'm I'm coming over. Oh no, you're not because I'm not there. <laughs> but um, all right, let's yeah. let's go ahead and wrap it up just a little yeah. bit so we can go ahead and end sources of income really quick. Yeah, vendor shows we yeah. talked about vendor shows online sales. We talked about yeah online mm -hmm. sales. Uh, local shops. Yeah, that's the third. Workshops is the fourth, mm -hmm. and the fifth thing, which is what I'm always pressing on, is the passive income. income. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to touch bases on that really, really quick before we go ahead and wrap it up. Mm -hmm. There are always ways for you to make a passive income, even mm -hmm. when something is a physical product. Again, you can make money off your skills. We're talking about workshops. You can pre-record those. You can maybe do the stencils, digital stencils for almost anything nowadays. Or just set up the tutorial um, so they can print it. Right, right. Yeah. Um, there's many different ways mm -hmm. of making passive income, which I think is a vital thing for any artist because let's face it, we can't do this for the rest of our lives, right? Unfortunately, we do always want to plan for the future. And that's just my goal is one thing that we always want to think about. Mm -hmm. But just to kind of... Yeah. End it, just yeah. planning. Planning is everything. Choose what you want to do, what money or whatever, what goal you want to set for yourself and set yourself for success. Exactly. Yes? Yes. All right, Always. guys. <laughs> we'll go ahead and if not, we keep on talking. Yeah, we can, do this just, we can do it all day. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. I hope you enjoyed. Please make sure if you have any other comments, concerns, questions, Leave it in the comment below. We'll go ahead and answer. If you have a question for her, just ask away. I'll make sure to relay whatever it is mm -hmm. that you know she says. And I'll go ahead and make sure in the description, I'll add all of her links, her Instagram, her Facebook, if you mm -hmm. want to go ahead and make that connection. Otherwise, we will Good. see you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. <laughs>